Hello world, we're here with part two of the Legacy Antigen. Aptly titled, A Wing and a Prayer. Count your blessings folks, let's see what this chapter has for us. I love this change, again, that they've gone with sort of a visual novel format, bringing in just pure text to bring us into the comic chapter, really cool change. 0917 hours, and this immediately tells you who we're talking about, I like this as well. 0917 hours, Syndicate Spindock, Jacob Young, and Hammond Stooge, Cheryl and Matchy make contact, want us to do their dirty work, again. You'll notice that this, you know, there's a nice little pattern with this as we go. 1006 hours, got my team, best of the best. And Silver. Hopefully he's useful. Again. We'll come back to Silver as well. 10.32 hours. Debrief with the foreman. That was the guy from last chapter. Lowe's not wearing her jump kit. I call her out. Again. Again. 10.35 hours. I watch someone I care about free fall to their death. And all I can think is... Please, God. Not again. Not again! Damn! That is some, oh, that was some super effective writing. I didn't even notice it first time I read this through. I love that we get this counterpoint at the end to... We're seeing Bangalore like we've never really seen her before. She's actually giving out here. And to show you how much she actually cares about Loba, like... She just openly admitted she cares about her. That's not in Bang's usual MO. So this hurts on, like... Multiple levels here. I love that we're getting this expansion of this character here. But, as we expected, the perfect character to stick in the middle of this budding romance is... Our girl Valk. If I knew beautiful women just fell from the sky, I would have signed up for the game sooner. I don't know who you are, but you have to let me go. Okay. At least, like, I was expecting less immediate conflict here. The voice lines that they have in-game, I think, are set maybe slightly further into the future from this point. How many girls have heard that, hey? She... Damn, they, they can feel it. There's sparks here, at least. This, this is fun. I can't deny that I enjoy the drama, right? Valk? Ram? You two know each other? Nice way to bring it in. I'm surprised that they didn't know that Valk could be turning up, unless this is part of her earning her way into the games, maybe? Noah, I gave her wings. We have to get everyone away from these vines. Stat. As we know from other voice lines, she is actually quite familiar with the Medusa vines from her time on Typhon. Wait a damn sec. Nah, Bangs. I trust this one. Evac she wants. I like the Rampart of all pe Well, not of all people, but perfect character to be here to be able to stick it to Bangs. Be like, nah, calm down. It's okay. It's cool. Which we need <laughs> to help Bangs feel jealous, right? Cool shit. Evac she gets. So once Rampart has shut everything down, later on. Thanks to the lift. Any sign of silver, Gibby? <laughs> Look at this side I hear, like, hey, I'm glad I gave you a lift. Nothing, sister. Maybe he ran away. I'm assuming that this is set sometime before Gibby's chapter, or leading into his community chapter, as we saw a few days ago. I assume from here he's going to go home and have the incident where Nick and Michael have been attacked by the Vines as well. And the comic is showing us that the Vines are going to be going uh, way further than just the Icarus eventually, I think, right? What's gotten into that boy? What's gotten into Silver? Been acting odder than usual since this morning. Now, Octane had reason to be out of sorts, given his uh, dad's like assassination attempt and the secrets that he's sort of trying to keep so that he doesn't really have to deal with them. He hadn't reacted about that anywhere near as severely as he has this. The Icarus turns up and that guy is sleeping on a park bench. I think that Ash's numerical codes that Octane and Lifeline know and know what they do has had some implication here the Octane could, I'm not obviously saying he definitely was, but he definitely could have been involved in resummoning the Icarus, if that's what Ash's codes were for. The only issue here is it might not fit the timeline for the Icarus, 
because we do learn through loading screens that the Icarus was sent to Typhon essentially right after it exploded. Which for Ash to have those sort of codes, as she theoretically died on Typhon the once, or had her head thrown into the Ark portal at the same time, either of those incidents would have made it so that she didn't have those codes, right? Although the Icarus is evidently a fairly important piece of Olympus history that it's quite fair for Lifeline and Octane to have known about, right? So, not entirely sure, but I do think there's potential for those codes and Octane's involvement with the summoning of the Icarus to turn up through this season. Name's Kairi Imahara. Call sign, Valkyrie. You must stay away from the vines. You can have a fatal reaction to them. Starts with bleeding eyes. 72 hours later, you're in a body bag. What's the cure? That's the bad news, Sarge. I didn't ask for bad news. And, oh, fuck. <laughs> I asked about the cure. Because if you're right, I got three days to figure out how to survive. So talk fast, new girl. Like, that's a proper cliffhanger, this chapter. Awesome way to raise the stakes here. Even though we, I think we all know that Bangalore is going to survive, putting her life at risk, just as when we put Loba's life at risk earlier, we knew Loba was going to survive, right? We have to remember that the characters don't. The characters don't have the same informed perspective that we do. Right? It's like when people question Loba's actions and go, oh, why doesn't she just use Revenant to take out the Syndicate? And it's like, because she doesn't, she doesn't have that sort of understanding. She may even know it was the Syndicate who did it, but she doesn't have the emotional attachment to anyone there to actually go and act out something against them. She knows that Revenant was there and knows what he did. She's not trying to metagame the situation like we can. Same thing here. Bangalore thinks that she's just died. That's an effective way to show us what these characters actually care about. Because for Bangalore, of all people, to tear up in front of everybody else, even though Pathfinder's quest shows she's a... Uh, She's actually relatively prone to crying. She's a lonely, upset woman, man. She needs some help. She needs some friends. She needs some people who can actually get her to open up to them on an emotional level. Like Loba can. Like, I was surprised by this. The fact that they're both showing just open, you know, physical affection for each other. The fact that Loba wanted to go to Bangalore to be put at ease. That's a cool development for these characters, man. Like, especially for Bangalore, who's been so obviously closed off this entire time. And so then how you put characters' lives actually at risk, when they're theoretically not at risk, but still have them mean something, is how they actually affect the other characters. So, I mean, you could still have Bangalore suffer some kind of actual consequences from either the cure or from the after effects of the Medusa antigen, right? You can still have the characters at hand still be at risk in some way. We're not taking Bangalore's life, but if we can risk her sight or risk her ability to compete in the games. Things like that that we can keep her in the game, but take her out of them in the story for a while. Things like that, right? But, again, it has much more impact in a story like Apex Legends' live service narrative, which is subject to its own very particular limitations, the greatest effect we're going to have here is on Loba. What do you think Loba would do to get the cure for someone she cares about? What could she give up in exchange for that? If you haven't caught where I'm going with this, the kind of dilemma you use this for, I don't know if they're going to, but if I was in the writer's room with them and they put this at me, I'd be like, well, then you make Revenant a key to getting the cure, and she has to give him the head back. Or so she has to give the head up in some way, or she has to help him get back towards his desired goal. The thing that she really does not want, but then you can see what she's willing to put at odds with the people she cares about. See what I mean? That's how you learn about these characters. You put the things that they love at risk, and you see how they react to that. In a position where Revenant can offer genuine, reliable, like, objective help here, it can come down to Loba being the bigger person and give Revenant what he wants so that he can help the person that she cares about. That's a fucking cool dilemma right there. 
and Revenant being Revenant can be super out and out about it, that he can, like, use it against her. He can make it very clear to the both of them that whether Bangalore lives or dies comes down to Loba's choice, which would then push her hand a little bit too much, maybe, actually. Be good if Loba is the one to actively make the decision that Bangalore surviving means more to her than how much she punishes Revenant. And maybe seeing that can make Revenant actually settle down in himself as well, that to see that Loba would put something else above him is going to really fuck with his narcissism, but maybe in a healthy way, eventually, right? These stories are all for the long term, they're all inflecting and like imparting on each other. One situation becomes a threat, so that it can prompt growth from another character, which leads to threat to another, and yada, and yada, it's a bunch of dominoes, right? If there's stuff sitting in the background that hasn't actually occurred yet, then you should probably imagine that it's sitting there for the time when it's relevant, when it's going to have impact in its own proper story. As Tom has come out and said, even since leaving Respawn, there's something more than friendship here, but it's going to take time to get to. I think even if we don't get Loba lore like this season, I think that's almost even for the best. The even if it would feel earned by the end of this season, how much more earned will it feel with another two seasons of story on top of it? How much more will we understand how much they actually care for each other and what they're willing to sacrifice of their own goals for the safety or the sake of each other? That's the kind of way you can get Bangalore building into taking on Loba's task of finally killing Revenant to set them both free. Like, that's a massive story arc that you won't see, like, actually occur for years. But this is the kind of groundwork that you have to lay to do that sort of thing. And if you've put these two in a relationship by that point, and Bangalore's there like, no, I'm going to kill Revenant for you two, Loba may not like that. It's either I do it because this was my thing, please let me fucking kill him then, or no, let him suffer. You then put their relationship at risk because of the things that they both want, even for each other. That is what these stories are for. They're about telling us who these people are. That is what their main function is at the end of the day, giving you a greater insight into the characters that you play as. Caring too much about plot and like ultimate goals like killing Revenant, remember, is likely to end up with Revenant no longer being in the story and therefore Loba probably not being in the story, unless you write her a completely new set of goals. And that takes a lot of effort and work, and can kind of sort of demean the whole point of the initial character, right? So, I'm really pleased with this chapter, it executed on stuff that we very much saw coming. I think a lot of us knew that Valk was going to rescue Loba, it was a very clear dynamic to set up conflict through the season. I maybe would have liked to see Loba still falling and have Valk turn up, get a few asides there, but okay, they have their limitations panel-wise, which again, I assume is just for them to have a reliable structure for their artists and for their style of storytelling. With seven panels as a maximum, you know within that space what beats you have to meet. And for how, again, sort of straightforward this is, it works. It's been executed really nicely, and it's been used, again, to develop Bangalore and Loba quite a bit further, and not in the way that I expected. There is actually less conflict here immediately than I thought there would be, but it's given us a different insight that I expected even less, right? Again, I love that Rampart is just pushing her way in here, she's asserting herself, this is cool. I like that she's almost this, like, younger sort of reflection, in a way, of Bangalore, that she obviously looks up to her as a woman who holds her own and can look after herself, right? I think they both respect each other on that front. But I think here, Rampart is being like the more emotionally mature one, that she understands the situation. She was obviously torn up a few panels ago about the potential loss of Loba as well. Girl's on side, but she's trying to keep everything in line. She's actually sort of picking up where Bangalore is leaving out, she's standing in to be there like, no, it's okay. it's okay, you don't have to lead us all the time. You've only got your own shit going on. And we get the reveal, as we've seen through loading screens, through the North Star cinematic, these two are actually older friends than they may even seem at this point. Things like that 
do bug me a little that it means we hadn't actually heard of Valk all this time, even though they have kind of been friends for way longer than we know. There's little things like that that do get at me about it, but I don't think it's worth actually being concerned about in the grand scheme of things. It doesn't kill my suspension of disbelief anyway. But then, sadly, I guess, to close us out, I have one little criticism overall about this season. There's elements that I like in the artwork, but the line work I don't feel is anywhere near as aesthetically pleasing as the artist from the last two seasons. It's not like a huge deal, like the art is still very good, and it's a hell of a lot better than I could do, but it doesn't feel like it has the same sort of charm as the artist from the last two seasons, and definitely nowhere near as much as any of the community comics. I like the colours, the, the colourist has returned from last season, they, I think they've got a really good eye for colour particularly. But yeah, some of the artwork personally, the line work specifically, doesn't feel as nice. It starts going into this odd sort of uncanny valley territory at times. There's certain bits like, I think this panel is actually really good. I love the dynamic bodily poses, but then again, when you compare that to say the latest community comic, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I think it is mainly in the facial work. Like this panel is pretty good, like it conveys the emotion well, and but again, that's largely done through color here in a way. And when you look at it too long, it starts looking weird. Hmm. Things like this, I think this is really well done, but again, this feels more like a colouring thing, right? It's about how the colours are shaded into the line work. So there's elements here that I think are really good, but personally, the art style for this season is actually my least favourite, and to the point where I think it's worth actually bringing up. Like, if I didn't have a negative sensation from it, I wouldn't have brought it up at all, do you see what I mean? It just would have been decent as far as concerned. But yeah, there's just something that feels a little off about this season's art style. Which is a little disappointing. But when they've built on their storytelling format by using things like text at the beginning of the chapters, the fact that they're incorporating the community chapters into this greater overarching story, the fact that their crazy sci-fi conceit is giving us a bunch of emotional dilemmas which are then building on top of each other to affect other characters, I assume we're going to see someone like Lifeline have to deal with Octane's problems. Octane is probably going to have to deal with his dad. Imagine what Silver Pharmaceuticals could do with the Legacy Antigen. Do you see what I mean? If you infect everyone with the Legacy Antigen and you become the only company with a cure, makes you wonder how involved someone like Eduardo Silva could have actually been here. Or even his son on the face of that as well if Octane saw that there were other advantages in doing it to maybe, like, stop his dad from doing something worse. So, yeah, continually impressed with this season, showing no signs of slowing down just yet, and when it comes to a cure, I think there's certainly characters like Caustic that you can look into, but that being said, Valkyrie didn't actually say there was no cure. She just said that there was bad news regarding the cure. So while that might seem on the face of it that there is no hope, and I am admittedly a little, a little confused as to why Bangalore hasn't fainted from the bleeding eyes as the other people we've seen infected do. So I'm wondering if there is like a degree of exposure, if people have degrees of immunity, because as Kyrie says, you could have a fatal reaction to them. So maybe there are some people who are immune. Maybe it's about different levels of exposure. Maybe there are different ways of experiencing the symptoms. I think we kind of have to keep Bangalore conscious. So that's a good idea. Maybe it would have been then a better idea to show the others having much worse blood or showing that they didn't pass out immediately. Like if we saw that Michael was still conscious and like screaming in pain in the most recent community chapter, this wouldn't have felt as unusual. So okay, a second little criticism, that while I like the conceit that they're using, I know that we're not going to kill Bangalore, 
but I'd rather you at least have some consistency in what your antigen is going to cause in people. And that said, actually, talking consistency, why was Valk looking directly at Bangalore and not commenting on the blood? There's actually some logical inconsistencies here that these two panels were definitely done for our sake, screw all logic in universe. And there's also a panel in chapter one where Bangalore is suddenly back outside the ship asking the foreman about the hatch in the floor. Whereas every other presentation, she just stays in the ship. It's little things like that that don't really matter, but they're starting to bug me a little. <laughs> the while the storytelling feels really polished, the way it's being executed on through the art doesn't. And that's kind of a shame. But that aside, I assume next week in the in-game comics is where we're going to start learning about the ways to look into a cure, and the community comics are going to be continuing from Gibraltar's storyline, giving us some more insight into the after-effects of these early in-game chapters, this first tangle with the vines. So, I hope you enjoyed A Wing and a Prayer. Let us keep the faith for Lobelore eventually. This is a great emotional core to focus on for this season, and we've only just started. There's going to be more to this. There's going to be more characters who get affected by this and who will have their own arcs to go through from this incident here. I'd like to think we've got quite a lot to look forward to. So, thank you for staying with me, friends. I've been Euclidean Vision, the emotional support. Take care of yourselves out there, teammates. And may the glorious light of best girl shine within you. Bye-bye.